Praise the Lord. Well, I do want to continue in our series, A World of Difference, Part 3, but welcome to everybody here. It's going to be a great message. How many of you are looking forward to a good message this morning? Okay, do you need something, to, an injection in your life? Do you know that you can hook up an IV during the rest of the week by reading your own Bible, right? Anyway, Extreme Makeover is the title of this Part 3, and we've got a picture here of a house before and after that's not our house although we have done a lot of makeovers in our house the kitchen and the bathrooms and we've been working on the yard and everything like that and then here's this girl before she um, wanted to go out into a modeling career she needed a little bit of a makeover and so she had a makeover you all know about that ladies right and men too some of the men have had lots of makeovers i think of bruce jenner for example anyway moving right along now but you know the funny thing about it is that when you take these physical examples of makeovers like the house and like your face and whatever it is in the community or something in a neighborhood, um, it starts with, if we have a look at uh, what we've got over here, um, a need for a makeover. There's got to be a need in the first place. You've got to recognize that there's a need. And then you need to come up with a blueprint, vision, or plan. You need an injection of resources. How many of you know that it takes a lot of money to do a makeover, right? A lot of money to do a makeover. John knows about that on his property. They, they've got a, a fantastic property um, out in Kenmore, and there's been so much that's gone into that property. It's actually looking like a park at the moment on the outside, and they're working, starting to work on the inside and get things going there. It's really a lovely property that they've got out there. He knows all about that injection of resources. But it does take some demolition. First, you've got to pull things down, and then you can construct them up again. And then finally, do you remember that show, The Extreme Makeover, where they had the houses, and that guy, Ty, who's a very bouncy ADD kind of a guy. Do you, anyone seen that program? We Pretty much. Okay, well, he would present the home. He'd say, move that bus. And they'd move the bus out of the way, and they'd take the blinkers off the people, so to speak. And they would look on this property that used to be like that one earlier on, kind of a very ordinary, run-down place. And now it's just this luscious home, and, and they've done this extreme makeover with all the sponsors and everything. It's just a wonderful a moment, a really moving a moment for those families who, who enjoy and receive the gift of this extreme makeover. And so I want to kind of make some uh, spiritual parallels this morning about the Greek, uh, the, the great makeover, because if you think of it, mankind needed saving from the fall of Adam in, 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 in the beginning of the book. The whole thing started off, mankind has been fallen since that, that point in time, and then Jesus came along, and he was able, through his death, burial, and resurrection, to raise us from the, death, the depths of sin and the, and the deadness of sin. And, and wow, just an extreme makeover that was available. The Holy Spirit then came along and uh, came to dwell on the inside of us. And so we've gone through this process of an extreme makeover. And so if you look at the Father's plan now, going back, digging back into the Old Testament here, the Father's plan is recorded for us, just a little snippet of it, because there's so much more that we could look into. But let's just have a look at this here. In Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27, it's a prophecy where God, through the prophet Ezekiel, said, A new heart. Everybody say, a new heart. A new heart. A new heart. Not an old, refurbished one with a little bit of duct tape on it, a little bit of, you know, super glue or whatever. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, which is referring to the stoniness part, unresponsive, unbending, dead. Can you think of anyone that you know that just does not respond to the things of God at this point in time? Maybe you and I were like that back in the day. That people would say things and we say, ah, not for me, not now. And we would not respond to the greatest news that was ever presented to us, that Jesus came to die on the cross, was raised again to open up the door for a new life and a new heart. Wow. But look what he would give us. He said, I will give you a heart of flesh. When I think of flesh, flesh is responsive. It's yielding. It's alive compared to stone. And so you've got the Old Testament and the New Testament compared here because the stone <coughs> refers to the stone tablets of the law and the flesh refers to the beating heart 
of God coming to live on the inside of us as new creation believers. Wow, it's interesting. So you see there, a new heart. See the notes there? Will I give you? Then you're going down. Will I put? Then I will take away. Guess who's the primary agent in this whole business here? It's the Lord. This speaks of His grace, of His sovereignty, of what He intended before you and I were even on the planet. This is a prophecy that took place many, many years ago. So what happens, if you move right along to the next slide, the Son comes along and consummates the plan. So you've got the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit involved in this great, great makeover here. And in John 19, verse 28 and 20 to 30, after this is the speaking of the cross now, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Interesting. An observation that when Jesus was on the cross, He was actually fulfilling Scripture. When he said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop and put it in his mouth. So when Jesus received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Now why would it be sour wine? Because the sourness of sin was being put on Jesus at this particular time. Our sin for his righteousness. And when he died and had said the words, it is finished, he gave up his spirit and bowed his head. As I mentioned early on. Wow, it's amazing. So look at the Holy Spirit here. Um, there are a couple of points that before we get onto the Holy Spirit. The root of the sin problem was was dealt with when he said it is finished. Secondly, the law's requirements had been fulfilled when he said it was finished. Thirdly, the new way of living that was wide open for all who believe had been established when he said it is finished. Because when God says something is finished, it's finished. It's no use you and I putting on a life support. And so when he comes along and injects his life into ours, it's no use us looking back into our past and looking back into our previous life and putting it on life support to say, well, this is the real me when God has placed us in a new realm, the realm of the new creation. Wow, interesting. Okay, let's move on to the Holy Spirit scripture here, where the Holy Spirit is the agent who comes along and infuses us with life. He's practically present on earth at this time. Question is, do we believe that he's present in this room this morning? We believe it. Do we necessarily feel it all the time? Or feel him, should I say? No. But we believe, therefore we experience. That's the pattern of God. And as we believe and walk with the Lord, we come to recognize the dealings of the Holy Spirit that He indeed was there. And He was speaking to our hearts and He was prompting us and He was urging us. And yet we may or may not have been listening that closely. Anyway, Titus chapter 3 verses 3 to 5. For we ourselves were also once foolish. This is a description of our past life. Disobedient, deceived. Serving various lusts and pleasures, and I'm not going to ask you to list your lusts and pleasures, okay? No deep, dark secrets here are required because they're all washed clean by the blood of Jesus. Amen? We may have a memory of them, but that memory is not our new reality. The Word of God is our new reality. Living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, but... When the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, through the washing and regeneration and renewing of His Holy Spirit. Wow! So look at some of these questions here. We were once, or these points. We were once. There's a distinct dividing line. But when? And the question I ask is, how big is your butt? Now don't turn around and walk out at this point, okay? But, you know, how big is the but that you put in your life? This is how you were. This is the situation that you faced. But Jesus came into my life. But. Everybody say, I've got a big. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my goodness. We're getting rude here. It's terrible. Not by works. But according to his mercy. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Now, unlike uh, the makeover that we saw earlier on with the picture of the house and, 
and, and uh, you know, there was the house, and then they made it over into a new house. In God's case, He reconstructs your spirit, your inner man, completely new, one of a kind, nothing connected to the past in your spirit man. Now your mind needs to be renewed and your body still has bald head or you're this tall or you're whatever, you're a male or a female. You stay the same in your physical body. But once you start to get a grip of the fact that your heart in your spirit man has been regenerated and renewed, it starts to dictate the rest of what's going on. Your thinking, your actions, your reactions, and even your physical health and vitality has, ha, has an impact when we believe that the work that the Holy Spirit does in our hearts, in our spirit man, is a completely brand new creation. Like a baby's bottom. Smooth. Mostly clean. <laughs> no, anyway. Oh gosh, this, these illustrations are terrible. <clears throat> anyway, Paul. Here's this guy, Paul. Remember the Apostle Paul from the Bible? He falls off his horse. Now, actually, this is a trick rider. She's actually holding on to it, and then she bounces back up. Is that what happens, Ellen, in these trick riders? I hope my kids aren't doing that. Okay, but anyway, <laughs> these trick riders, they can do it. But, you know, Paul was riding on the road to Damascus, which is in Syria today, where they've got all that problem with the Russians and the Syrians and the ISIS and and all the troops there and refugees and everything. But nevertheless, he's on the way to Damascus to take out Christians. He's a zealous religious bigot and he has an encounter with the Lord and falls off his horse. And so beforehand, before this great change in his life where he became from a persecutor to a, 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 a preacher, he was mean and nasty. He was seeking out people who were following Jesus and persecuting them heavily. So much to the degree that even when Stephen uh, was martyred, he was there as an accomplice to that martyrdom. He was an accomplice really to murder in our terms. Their terms, they thought they were doing God a favor. Our terms, we see it to be what it really was. So he was a hard-hearted persecutor. Look at the scripture. For you have heard... Of my previous way of life in Judaism. So he has a big butt in his life. He cuts it here and he says, that's what I used to be. How intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. And he doesn't say I was extremely zealous for the Lord himself and he had his stamp of approval on me. No, he had bought into the whole religious setup and was extremely zealous in maintaining and setting and continuing to further that, that setup, the Judaism. So when the Christians came along, he started to persecute them big time. He was the leading character. It's much like taking any one of the ISIS leaders today to use an example and saying that key leader there suddenly had an encounter with the Lord and was changed and became a Christian. And now is preaching the gospel because this is what happened to, to Paul here. Look at what happened to him afterwards where his heart changed from a hard, unyielding heart to a yielded heart and became a preacher. And this is how he comments on it. But when it pleased God, this is Paul speaking again, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles amazing he started to preach the gospel among the gentiles and at first they just shaking their heads and said could it be is this some kind of a trick is he going to sneak in amongst us here claiming to preach the gospel and then turn on us and have us all killed they were actually unsure of this but there were a couple of people ananias to start with that said no this is legit he's had this born again experience this encounter with the living god and he's changed we need to let him into our fellowship and let him start preaching, which is what happens. So I want to try and answer some questions here about whether we are dogs or cats. Now, when I was growing up, if you can just hold it there, Greg. Um, when I was growing up, um, this thing keeps squeaking here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop it. I, uh, when I was growing up, I used to think that all dogs were male and that all cats were female. Until I took a look under the hood and found out that, no, that wasn't the case. 
But you know, there are, there's such confusion when you're growing up and you don't know certain things. But when you get to know certain things, then it all starts to make sense. That why some of these cats in the, in the alley start to fight and they go, Meow. can you hear that? Oh, they scratch on the, on, they scratch, that scratching sound, that meowing sound. Anyway, dogs and cats. Are we sons or are we sinners? That is the question. So let's have a look at that theme as it plays into our overarching theme of the extreme makeover. How extreme is God's makeover in our lives? Look at the scripture. John 1.12 But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So we have certain rights as children of God. First one being identity. Completely new identity. We used to be, and some people were worse than others, sons of the devil. You know, you think of these rock, uh, heavy metal, Metallica, or uh, you know, whatever it is. Some of these are really bad <laughs> rock bands where the guys are all on speed and they're all skinny and they, their shirts are off and all their hairy chests and everything like that. And they just got their heads and they're, and they're singing about Satan and they're, they're just going absolutely berserk and drugs and alcohol and sex and booze and phew, man, that, that looks like evil, right? <laughs> but you know that evil is more subtle. Than that. That's on the one extreme, and on the other extreme, evil is evil, and it's a whole spectrum of it. Those guys, we kind of look up and we see, oh my goodness, that was that was bad. But anyway, this is what he says here: that we are now children of God to those who believe in His name. Verse thirteen: who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. So, do you think? That this terminology being born is used accidentally or just as a metaphor or something like that? Or do you think that in our spirit man we are truly born again? Have a brand new fresh start in the Lord? I think the answer is yes. Certainly from this scripture. There are other scriptures that seem to prove and show that God has done a new work and a fresh work in our hearts. Completely new. Something that is not just a kind of a duct tape makeover in that sense, but a completely new birth. And think of a birth now. A birth involves seed. A birth involves a womb. A birth involves growth. A birth involves delivery. And those patterns are found very often in a person's life and conversion to start with and then growth thereafter. Look at this other scripture here, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. This is how Peter got revelation of this whole thing, how we came to be in God's family. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, so here he introduces the idea of seed, and the seed is the word of God, right? But incorruptible through the word of God which lives and abides forever. So the seed that we received into our hearts, that the Holy Spirit uh, energized and breathed life into, changed us on the inside to, into a completely brand new person. It was a miraculous thing. It was a supernatural thing. I don't know, Sue, you can remember me grow, uh, living together in our early marriage when she got saved as an adult and received Jesus in the fullness as an adult. And then she started to work on me and the Holy Spirit started to work on me. And then you noticed a couple of changes, right? Were there any changes that you noticed? <laughs> what were some of them do you think that you wouldn't mind sharing out loud so we can all hear and get on the tape? Yeah, why not? Okay. Yeah, if you want to. Yeah, just talk. Well, just Ed, go for it. Ed was an atheist, <laughs> a very academic atheist who was very proud of his um, non belief in Nonsense, God. Nonsense, I was much better than that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was always kind of searching and searching. And when we got married, I kind of had a hunger for the Lord without knowing it was there just from the time I was a little. And I said to him, you know, are we going to believe in God? Are we. And he said, no, there's no such thing, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, we don't believe in God. And I felt something like curl up and die in me. It was weird. And then I got born again, praise God. <clears throat> and he thought I'd gone nuts. He really had. He started going around to Definitely. all kinds of people. He went to a Catholic priest. He went to some 
uh, like worldly philosopher and started asking him about me and they will say don't worry she's settled down she's just crazy but <laughs> she's one of those charismatic yeah so and i had such a hunger for the bible i didn't sleep for like three months i was just reading the bible day and night it was kind of crazy and no one he thought i was nuts but then yeah i would do I, what happened that night i can still remember the bedroom you know in, in the little semi-detached apartment that we had in a place called yeovil in johannesburg south africa and I would, I would be, you know, in the middle of the night, she'd be reading the Bible, like two, three in the morning and everything. And I'd say to her, come on. And she would say, okay, fine, fine. And she would lay hands on me and? I'd just pay Father, please put him to sleep. And then he'd go to sleep. <laughs> no, just knock him out. Just get him out of the way. <laughs> and so then um, he was so stubborn, but I could see the Lord working on him. And so I prayed. When I got born again, the prayer that I prayed, I said, Lord, don't give him one minute's peace until he accepts you. And I thought, okay, I'm leaving it in God's hand. I'm not going to say things. So I didn't preach at him. I didn't do anything. I used to just get go to church, come back, and um, read my Bible and everything. But he was, like, struggling and almost tormented, in a way, with the Holy Spirit conviction. And it was interesting to see because I just didn't have to say a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Woman have a way. <laughs> no, it was the Lord. Well, I didn't, the Holy Spirit, I didn't yeah. But women have a way with the Holy Spirit, you know. They yeah. just let them loose on these yeah. stubborn jackass so, so, men. And then when you got born again, so yeah. what was your testimony? That you, He said from the time I got born again until two years later, until he received the Lord, he said he never had a moment's peace while he was awake and not occupied in his career or doing something with people. But when he was on his own, he was always being convicted. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. I would be standing up in front of the children at, at the high school that I taught at. And I, was, I taught this particular class a few times in the sense that um, I knew the material well enough. And as I was teaching the material, I was thinking, and under conviction, I was thinking, oh, Bible, Jesus, cross, you know, Bible, you know, whatever. It was, it was insane. It was insane. I was under so much conviction. But, you know, like Paul had to be knocked off his horse, it took me two years of the Lord's patience to say, oh, come on now, come on, come on. And people would come up and they would, they would witness to me. And the one guy said, why don't you just say Jesus is Lord? You know, just say Jesus is Lord and then everything will be cool. So I don't believe Jesus is Lord. So why would I say Jesus is Lord? He said, you must have a demon, you know, <laughs> something like that. Because you can only say Jesus is Lord by the Spirit of God. And he just could, he shook his head. And then when he found out that I got saved, he, you know, he shook his head again. But anyway, but that's, you know, in, in our case and in many others that you can hear stories of, there have been radical extreme makeovers in people's lives. There's been this situation and then that situation. But having said that, when I gave my heart to the Lord, I started out with a very, if I can use my fingers like this, a very tentative faith, very small and not powerful and strong and you know, sort of mighty and everything. I, I, was, I was still confused in my mind but I knew something had taken place in my heart. And I started to hear the Word of God through music. Music was a very powerful thing. We used to have these big LP records that about the size of the table. Do you remember the old LPs, a 33 and a third RPMs? They would go round and round and they would, the music would play. It's amazing the technology that we have today. I mean, those, you know, round bit of plastic music. Oh, it's like a phone. Oh, sorry. Okay. I know what you're talking about. Anyway, moving right along now. Some of you are looking at me. What is going on here this morning? Moving right along. There was a change in my life and things developed over that time. Let's have a look at how extreme is this makeover really? Look at Second Peter. This is Peter commenting once again on this experience. And he's giving us some instruction as to how, how to grow in him. But he brings out something really powerful towards the end of the passage. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This is 2 Peter 1 verses 2 to 4. As his divine power has given to us. Look at the past tense there. All things that pertain to life and godliness. It's not as if God has to, when he answers our prayers, he has to say, oh my goodness, have I got one of those things? Have I got enough of that stuff? Because I know people over there in India are praying, and there's some people in South America praying, but you praying here, just wait your turn, because uh, you know, I've, I've got a lot on my plate. 
You understand? A lot of my place. Wait, 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 wait. And some people think that when you pray to God, He says to them, yes, no, or wait. Hmm. I think we need to think about that one. And we probably will when we uh, look at uh, the subject of prayer, perhaps in a, a new series coming up in the future sometime. Okay? Yes, no, or wait. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I'll leave that one hanging out there. As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given, past tense again, exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these exceedingly great and precious promises, you and I might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. How big is Peter's butt here? Corruption, the old life, escape into the new life, partaking of God's new nature. A radical differentiation. Powerful. Hmm. So, I think last week we talked a little bit about the jailbreak, you know, breaking free from the jail of sin and whatever it is, and we've got this picture here. And the question is, do we step out into the wide open spaces of God's grace? Or do we stay close by in the prison yard and when they blow the whistle, we exercise. And when they blow the whistle again, we come back in and we're in, in the prison. And yet Jesus, by his work, has completely and radically set us free from the prison cell of, uh, of sin and its consequences. And he expects us to step out into the wide open spaces. He doesn't want us hindered by distance and delay of religiosity. So yeah, you've got this picture of a, a deep dark, dark dungeon with tiny little windows and everything like that. And I think even worse so, back in the day, the dungeons when Paul and Silas and Peter were thrown in prison, they didn't have prisons like this even. Certainly they didn't have prisons like we have today with TV sets, with gym exercise, with correspondence courses, with telephones, with postal service, with medical care and everything. They threw them in prison. If you survived, you survived. If you didn't survive, then they didn't have to feed you anymore. Wow. And look at that in contrast now with the wide open spaces represented by this field here of lush growth, of green, of freedom, of liberty. If we step out into this realm here, don't you think that that's God's will for us when it comes to the new birth? When it comes to being a Christian. I believe so. Let's not play safe and hang around the prison precincts. In case if something happens, we can run back into the shelter of our past habits and past go-tos. A lot of people take comfort and, and, and um, find uh, consolation in watching a TV program or... Uh, Doing some activity, you know, working in the garden or something. I mean, we just escape from the challenges of life. And some of those things, watching TV is not inherently bad. Working in the garden is not inherently bad. Having a nice meal is not inherently bad. We, in fact, know of a pastor's wife that if there was any pressure or, or, or issue that she and, and, and people close to her on, on the female side were facing, they said, well, let's just go into the kitchen and bake a cake. Do you remember that? And, and that was their way of getting out of, out of facing the issues. I know I must feel uh, ad identify a little bit with that because when you look at the news, which is not always a good idea, when you look at the news and you see this stuff going on, you just want to retreat into a little safe space. Well, and yet God himself is saying, listen, the safe space that I want you to retreat into is not that old prison cell of past habits and things like that and go-tos, you know, drinking or drugs or whatever, you know, stuff like that. No, I want you to retreat and come under the shelter of my wings, into my arms, cuddle up close there and recognize that God is, uh, that I, God, am with you, as we sung earlier on, and I, God, am for you. And I surround you with my favor as a shield. That's our safe space of refuge. Emotionally, physically, whatever it is. Hmm. So, 
what happens now if you go out into this great realm of grace? Isn't there a danger that something can go wrong? You can take advantage of the situation and sin and everything like that. Well, fortunately, if the Holy Spirit has come to live in our hearts, He comes to our rescue. And the scripture says there in chapter 8, verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, some Christians do a better job of listening to God's voice, the Holy Spirit, than others. So they appear to be more led of, of God than others. But yet, if you have heard the voice of God to come to Jesus, give your heart to Him, you have been led by the Holy Spirit to that point. And He's waiting at the next step to say, this way, come over here, come over there, don't go there, come this way. And He will always lead you into a place of holiness. He'll always lead you into a better place because God is with us in the Holy Spirit and God is for us. He's not against us. He would never lead us to do anything that is sinful. Yes? yes. And so the question becomes, do we live our lives from the inside out or do we retreat into a realm where you've got all these rules and regulations that keep us within the safe zone that if you get up close there's a fence there if you get up close over there there's another fence there of these rules and regulations that's not god's way today in the new testament it's not his best so the holy spirit will always lead us in a righteous direction helping us to function properly in a godly way in this realm of grace. Okay, so what happens then if you do slip up as a Christian? What happens if you do fall in sin as a Christian? Well, the answer to that is like Noah was inside the ark and he might have stumbled and fell, he always fell within the ark, right? So we are within the ark of Jesus' salvation. We're in his realm of grace. That if we stumble and fall, we don't fall outside of his kingdom and go back into Satan's kingdom. We fall inside God's kingdom and he picks us up. He's the lifter of our heads and he dusts us off and he says, keep going. This is the way walking in it. Right? Now, obviously, part of that process is saying, my goodness, I slipped up. Where did I go wrong? Lord, I'm sorry. And we confess our sin, that particular sin of doing it. But we're not confessing our sin to get forgiven. We are already forgiven. We're just confessing our sin to kind of solidify the fact that that's where we went wrong. So we don't need to go that way again. That's the way I see that particular part there too. Anyway, we fall within the ark of God's realm of grace, not in and out of his safety. And to fall from grace. How many of you heard that expression, to fall from grace? Right? As Christians, people say, oh, you know that preacher... That guy that drives around in a Rolls Royce, you know that one? You know, the one in the Rolls Royce. And we heard that they had to remove him from his pulpit because he ran off of the secretary. And we say he fell from grace. He fell from grace. And we equate falling from grace with that particular sin. Yes, it was sin to run off with the secretary. Yes, it's sin to run off with the money. Yes, it's sin to manipulate and abuse people in the church and everything like that. Blah, 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 blah. But it does not mean, according to the Bible, that means that you fall outside of the realm of God's grace. Because if sin is the main thing that gets you confessing, gets you in, and then if you fall, you get out. Man, you, every Sunday morning, you should be up at the altar here giving your life to Jesus again. Because last week, you and I, surely in some attitude or sin or real thing that we did, fall short of God's glory. So the issue becomes, are we conscious about the Son of God and what He's done for us and that we're in within His realm of grace? Or are we more conscious about, oh man, I better not sin. I better not have this bad attitude. Oh Lord, I've got this bad attitude. I confess my sin. Oh, forgive me, Lord. I just can't do this anymore, so let me go and have a drink. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, that's what some people do. They just can't live it, live it up to the standards. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's not the way God wants us to live. He doesn't want us to think that falling from grace involves giving into some passion, um, some, some vice or whatever, some passion of the flesh. But, have a look at this. 
Galatians chapter 5, we've seen the notes there that to go back to relying on your own efforts under the law is what falling from grace is all about. Negating Jesus' work on the cross because the just shall live by faith. So we get to Galatians chapter 5 verses 1 and 4 through to 4 here. Stand fast, therefore. It sounds like you're in the ground, you need to stand your ground. In the liberty by which Christ has made us free. It's already a done deal. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. And most people think it's sin that we're talking about here. But here the bondage is trying to keep the law. Indeed, I, Paul, saying to you that if you become circumcised, which is an indication of trying to keep the law, Christ will profit you nothing. Why did Christ die if all your efforts over here are what really stacks it up to make a pile of righteousness? No, it's what Christ did that stacks up the righteousness. You and I have faith in him and we become righteous. And in verse 3, I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he's adhered to keep the whole law. If you're going to start along that route, you may as well keep the whole nine yards of it. And then in verse 4, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. That's the context. That's the whole story there. Hey, Greg, you're ahead of me here. My goodness. We're into the chickens. Let's go back to the chickens now. Thank you. Never mind the fish stories. You know, how many of you have known of people who go fishing? They said, I caught a fish that was about, about this big. You know, meanwhile, it was about that big. Anyway, this is chickens. This is not actually a photograph of our chickens. I couldn't get my camera to work and, and get everything to, to, to get a picture of our chickens. But I did come up with um, a chicken story. When, uh, when you look at the next clip here, have a look at this. This is our garden, and here I am stalking the chickens. Let's turn up the volume, Greg. Let's turn up the volume, and let's hear what's going on. Stalking the chickens in our garden. These are our chickens, our garden. And I don't know whether you can see this, but under the tree here at home, our home, uh, are a bunch of our chickens. And guess what? They're having a dust bath. Supposedly it helps with the mites and all that sort of stuff in their feathers, but boy, do they just make a beeline for this dust bath under this tree here. And that's what chickens do. <laughs> I don't think you ever find eagles uh, messing around in the dust. They tend to fly high above on the hunt for their prey. But just as a contrast, I've got some thoughts on the subject of chickens and eagles as it relates to the new creation. Okay, so I've got a story to tell you about some chickens and an eagle. There was an eagle that got orphaned. Parents were killed, some, something, and as a tiny baby eaglet that this farmer found, he raised them amongst the chickens in the coop. He brought this tiny little eaglet and he was able to put it in the coop and protect it and, and raise it up in the coop with the, with the chickens. And as it grew, the other chickens started talking that he was looking more and more like an eagle. My goodness. But the eagle said, no, I was raised among you guys. And uh, as they say, once a chicken, always a chicken. Hmm. Then one day, as he'd grown, and his wings had grown, still pecking around amongst the chickens and having dust bars and things like that, he heard the screech of an eagle, another eagle, high above the coop, far up in the sky. And so he got out of the coop, he stretched his wings, he took a flap or two, and he soared off into the wide open space of eagle sky. Sadly, the next day he was back and ate one of his chicken friends. <laughs> My comment, what's the moral of the story? Choose to be who you really are and fly high into the wide open spaces of God's grace, knowing that your back is covered. Jesus has got your back. And as you and I Grab a hold of those promises, those exceedingly great and precious promises. You and I will behave right. As we believe right, we'll behave right. And we'll be partakers and manifest the partaking 
of God's divine nature. Just as a final takeaway, if we're going to prepare our hearts for communion at this time, and maybe Sue and Jill, if you wouldn't mind serving us the communion elements in a moment. God took, as you can see in the notes there, extreme measures. Our theme has been extreme makeover. But he took these extreme measures to give us an extreme makeover. And if salvation, our salvation, is simply about becoming a better person, being good to people, following Jesus' example, then why would it not mock the extreme suffering that Jesus went through on the cross to purchase our salvation and to pave the way for the new birth? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. From sinner by nature to saint or son of God by birth. That's the difference. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, feel free to get up as the music plays um, and receive communion.